So wow. anything could happen. Did they keep talking until everybody got out? <laughs> we started talking and then it was so loud we had to wait until we finished. It was exciting though. Um, I would like to welcome Cy Spurrier, Rob Williams and Garth Hicks. <laughs> All three of you have worked in British comics and in American comics for a number of years. Um, and I think you all got your big break on either 2000 AD or a sister title, uh, Crisis in the Sense uh, mm. of you, Garth. Um, how did you get your foot under the door to start off with? Who's going to go first? This is quite right, exciting. You, yeah. Pull rank, pull rank. I am. Um, <laughs> I'll do it instead. No. Um, <laughs> I was in a pub, which is where all great stories start. And um, I did a book, um, a first comic called Class War. And uh, I pitched, I think, two things to 2000 AD. I've told this story many times over years, one of which David Bishop replied, uh, wrote me a letter back saying, congratulations, you have sent in the most unoriginal feature <laughs> shock we have ever received in 2000 AD. So that was nice. Um, Good old dear. Yeah, friendly. Um, but then um, I was in a pub and Andy Diggle was there, he was editor at the time, and Andy liked class war. And he said, you should write for 2000 AD. And it's just, I managed to circumnavigate the the future shock way in basically of doing occasional ones and he just offered me a series so um yeah but then in a way by starting out with an independent comic publisher that was your way of yes of course so how did you get um class war at comic x um they were very enthusiastic and very naive because i just and i didn't know what i was doing as well so i just turned up at bristol comic con first comic con i'd ever been to and i'd written the full script it wasn't even a pitch and i just gave them this wedge of paper and said i'd like this is my comic and then they rang me about three months later and said, um, yeah, we want to do it. So I was right place, right time. But it was just a case of just me not having the foggiest what I was doing and just writing something that I thought would be fun, to be honest. Nice. Yeah, I was right place, right time as well. Um, I, was, uh, I submitted a couple of ideas to Crisis, which some people might remember. It, it was, as you say, a sister title to 2008. It was a political comic. I found this out later, but um, essentially the seals were slipping badly and they were desperate. And of course, at that time, so many British writers and artists had gone to the States because they could get better deals there. And um, for uh, British editorial, it was a case of beggars can't be choosers. So um, I called them up. Uh, it was actually my 19th birthday. I just thought, worth, worth a pump, I suppose. And, um, expecting, yeah, we'll get back to you, kid, and instead I got, oh, yeah, we wanted to talk to you about that. And purely because they needed something fast, uh, they took a chance on a complete novice. So, yeah, right place, right time. Good. Um, I'm, mine's very boring. Uh, I discovered 2008 quite late. Um, was an arrogant arsehole and decided that if somebody else could do it, then I could do it better. Um, so oh, that didn't change. I know, right? <laughs> it's, it's the beginning of the story. Uh, Spent about three years sending in really bad Future Shock submissions. I too have a David Bishop story. In fact, I have two. Uh, I have one rejection letter from him that says, um, I'm sorry, Simon. I'm afraid you just don't have the spark of crazed ingenuity it takes to write for 2000 AD. Thank you, Dave. And then the next one, uh, I obviously ignored that and carried on going. And the next one that I get, and I shit you not, this is true, it says, <coughs> No, 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 <laughs> italic, no. <laughs> Yours, Dave. Um, what was that response to? Just another bevy of utterly generic crap future shots. And then I was about like 17 doing all this. And then at some point I realised that if the guy is being good enough to send me advice in his rejection letters, I should probably pay attention to it. Um, started doing that and eventually got a gig. Um, it's that simple, very boring. And in terms of sending <coughs> his first scripts, um, 
had you looked at the way the comic strips were written in general that you thought perhaps they should be laid out in a certain style to make it easier for the editor? Or did you think as long as it's intelligible as a comic script and has ideas that might excite an editor, that's the way to do it? I think, I mean, in my case, it was to, to get the foot in the door, the real talent is not necessarily writing the script, it's pitching the idea mm -hmm. with the future shock in particular. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is just craft and you can sort of learn it or choose to, to wing it as most of us did. Mm -hmm. How about you, Rob? Um, yeah, so right. I mean, it's just uh, it, at the time it was like there was no. It was before the internet, so there was no comic scripts out there really to find. There was like a John Wagner script in a Dread Annual or something, you know, which was that's oh, the one I used. So okay. that's shit. That, that's how you do this, and that was like I. So, and there was, I think, uh, that's the, the one with the classic panel three Dread Grim Grim. grim. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so it's. I mean, if you want to actually, it's not the way I did it, but if you want work, you really need to be able to practice the pitch and sort of, you know, tighten up the pitch and everything and just sort of have that wonderful thing of being able to sell something in about, in a sentence, you know, and immediately go, I'll publish that. I mean, everything beyond that is, is as precise as the craft side of it. Mm. I mean, Garth, that first script that you had published by um, Crisis Troubled Souls mm -hmm. was obviously also responding to the troubles uh, in Ireland. Yeah. Crisis being a political comic, do you think that was something that also piqued their interest, the fact that you were doing something that was political? Uh, yeah, I'd actually spoken to Steve McManus when the Crisis signing tour came to Belfast uh, the, the previous October, um, and I'd asked him, would you be interested in a story about the situation here? And he said, that's exactly the kind of thing we're after. Uh, so that was a bit of opportunism, really. Um, but yeah, it, it was at that time when there was this theory that adult comics were going to be a thing. Um, you're talking about the, the era of Deadline, Crisis, Revolver, Blast, Strip, uh, all those things. I mean, it, it was kind of a false dawn, to be honest, but for a brief period, yes, there was interest and there was money to spend, and that was when I slipped in, I suppose. Obviously, you've all uh, written stories that have gone on for a certain number of issues, whether they've been serialized in 2000 AD or individual comics. How often have you found that when you started something, it has gone into a very different direction? I mean, even thinking of Troubled Souls, uh, Garth, that begat a slightly more comedic sequel for A Few Troubles More, and then that begat a completely ridiculous, surrealist yeah. comic fix. Yes. I'm assuming you weren't planning that from the start. No, no, not at all. I mean, when I started writing Troubled Souls, uh, I had no real ambition beyond beyond it. Obviously, I wanted a career in comics, but I focused totally on Troubled Souls. What I found was that um, as word of the story spread, because it, it did develop a certain reputation, and it was reprinted in a nice hundred-page graphic novel, full-color artwork. That was that was a great sort of kind of portfolio in a way of of my work and American publishers picked up on it but I had the sense that I was being pigeonholed as the sort of terribly sincere honest political writer no really <laughs> um, and, and I thought I need to do something to show that I've got more than one string to my bow and that was why we did John McRae and I did for a few troubles more because we just want to do something ridiculous and then when the two characters become detectives, that becomes dicks, and it just goes completely insane. Um, but I suppose it, it all had its roots in the appallingly sincere troubled souls. Yeah. You guys, have you ever started a story where you think it's going to go in one direction and it goes in a completely different way, even a different genre? <coughs> Temptation to make a marriage joke here is quite strong. Is she in the audience? My ex might be. No, carry on. I think, it, I, I think it always kind of has. You, you kind of you want to know the end before you go in, and you have theme in you know in mind and things like that. And very often you get halfway through, and you'll kind of go, "It's not that at all. It's this." And sort of it, you've you've got to allow it to do that. That's part of the process. You know, it does happen. Um, things go in, do go in completely different directions you intended. I, I sort of, I, you know, there is a kind of myth about the writer has to, sort of, everything has to be meticulously planned beforehand, and that's true. But you've got to give yourself a leeway to kind of, you know, something will flick, you know, and you'll kind of go, "Oh, this is a far better way of doing that," and suddenly you're off in a little bit of a different direction. But I think, you know, I, I'm going to use a theme word, and you can sort of tut and kick me again. Right. But it's, um, 
but I think as long as you stick true to the theme, you know, then you've got the, the leeway to actually veer around wherever you want to go along the way, basically. If mm -hmm. you take away, if, you, if a, you lose the theme, suddenly you kind of go, you get halfway through and think, well, thing's lost its spine. You're not entirely sure what you're writing anymore, why you're writing it. But um, I think, yeah, you've, you've got to be able to sort of improvise a lot, and that's just part of the job, I think. Yeah, look at the, if you look at the classic era uh, of Judge Dredd, written by John Wagner and Alan Grant, that was effectively their MO. They would start out with a rough sense of where they were going, but not really knowing the ending. And uh, I mean, that could work brilliantly, the Apocalypse War. Mm. Uh, sometimes it didn't work so well, City of the Damned. Mm -hmm. um, but on the whole, you know, that, that sort of, um, that sort of freedom that they granted themselves led to all sorts of wonderful, wonderful work. Mm. I tend to start, like, I've never started a story that I didn't know how it would end. Um, which can be a problem if you are in that lucky situation of having pitched a miniseries and it does well enough that it becomes an ongoing and you're like, holy shit, I need to find a new ending. And there is that, it sounds a bit wanky, apologies, but there is that thing where the character sort of takes over and the ending you expected the character to have ends up being something different, but at least you're guiding as you start. To, to Rob's point about theme, I read a thing, and I always waffle on about this, because I think it's, it's something to hold up. I don't think any of us really are, are this... Um, focused when we sit down to write, but anybody seen Wally? You know the, the Disney movie with the little robot. The guy who wrote that, whose name I can never remember, you'll know. Can't remember. All right, useless. Um, <laughs> the guy who wrote that, he is a massive fan of the controlling idea, to a, a sort of ridiculous degree, whereby you you don't just have a sort of vague nebulous theme. You have this statement, a statement of fact, which you boil down to find exactly the right words. You know, it's about the choice of the exact language you use. And for Wally, it's five words. It's irrational love overcomes life programming. Now, everything in that movie, from the overall story, to what happens in every scene, to the character arcs, to every line of dialogue, is a version of that story, even if it's a totally subverted version of it. And I love that, because it means that even if you end up going in completely the wrong direction, or the character takes over, you you have this thing that keeps dragging you back. This is what my story is about. So I try to do that and I, without very much success because it's, it's often um, you don't have quite as much time and luxury to be that precise in comics, but it's a nice thing to aspire to. I think theme actually sort of, sort of, sort of saved my sort of process along the way because uh, you, can, you can do that thing. There's a billion different ways that a story can go, but a theme keeps you on the path, basically. And I like think that... that, that the culmination of the story either proves the theme correct or, mm. or disproves the theme. You know, it can go one of two ways. But I think so much of writing is about these these little craft sort of um, paths that keep you going in, in in the right direction and not getting lost with a billion, um, you know, a billion ways a story could go. Because then you end up just staring out the window, paralysed. By but stuff, I mean, like stuff like Preacher. Presumably, you didn't know exactly how long that was going to be before you started it. No. So no, it was uh, leap into the dark and cross your fingers, really. Um, I, I wrote about 20 issues of that before I figured out how it was going to end. Right. It, the first two years were really, I said this yesterday, I really proceeded on instinct. Uh, like, let's put on a bit here and let's try this. And, um, and then around about issue 20, it was like, oh, I know where it's going. Cool. And then a few years later, when I started The Boys, um, I had a lot more of it figured out. I knew how it would end. I knew many of the main scenes so there were still things i came up with as i went but uh, yeah that was uh, that was a bit tighter that one. Did you have five words though ultimate power doesn't necessarily corrupt that movie. <laughs> couldn't get it down to five but i think it was something like superheroes are twats they need a slap these are the boys to do it <laughs> i think that was it um back in the day there used to be kind of a career path in British comics that you probably would start out in 2018 yeah. and you'd hope you'd get posted. Future shock to the series end. to America. Yeah. Um, as such, all of you did kind of go down that process to a certain extent and indeed you've all read, you've all written either Judge Dredd or Dreadverse um, stories. Kind of entering your own ideas into a long running narrative like that, is that daunting or is exciting in a way because you know you are adding a little bit of mythology? Well, I made a total hash of it, so probably better you answer that one, Rob. I think it's kind of both. You can't, you can, if, with any of these things, you, can, you, you can't let yourself get caught up in this 
40 years of history of like amazing stories. And if you kind of go, oh Christ, how am I going to write some a dread as good as, you know, some of the best John Wagner dreads or something? And you, again, you'll just paralyze yourself. So you just um, you just try and just try and tell a good story that interests you. I mean, that's the bottom line with it. It's just like I don't think you you can get too caught up. And you can't pat yourself on the back too much about <coughs> adding to the mythology. It's just like it's if you think it's a good story and it's got something to say about the character. I mean, I like writing Dread because I, the thing that clicked for me for writing Dread was, was writing the man rather than him as some kind of robocop kind of figure, you know? And just, um, I like the fact that you can write all the emotions of Dread beneath the stoicism of the sort of, you know, the grim this exterior where he says two words. Mm -hmm. but there's all this other stuff churning underneath and everything, his own motives. And that, that just what got me excited and why I think I've, Give me a bit of life actually writing the character. Mm. I've always been too intimidated by him to do that. Mm -hmm. When I've ever written Dread, he's a, a fulcrum around which the stuff I'm interested in turns. You know, I like the city, I like the madness, I like the stuff that Dread is very against. But whenever I've had the opportunity to get inside his head, I don't know what's going on. Well, that's why I, I did that and, and I was kind of felt like I was always surface skimming it, you know what I mean? And you can tell fun stories and good stories mm -hmm. and everything, you know. But um, I don't I just personally, that's just what clicked for me. I thought I'm going to have a go at actually writing him, and suddenly I kind of felt like. Do you relate to him a bit? Yeah. Not just because. And I like writing old grumpy dread. I would be no good writing first year on the street straight. I don't think I'd be I'd be good for that at all. But as he gets older and grumpier, I think I kind of, I kind of feel a lot of it as well. <laughs> and I think he's essentially a selfish person as well. I think it's all for his own motives. That's just my read on it. I don't think it's John's, but might not agree. I think if a law is like, there's a line in one of my stories which is, um, <coughs> if uh, if he, you know, we're just lucky that he's he's in the uniform because if he wasn't in the uniform, he'd still be out there on the streets killing a bunch of mm -hmm. people, basically. But uh, but yeah, that's just my take on him. Mm -hmm. but, but also, you've both uh, written Mega City uh, Underground, um, so in a way, you've got to work in the marginalia for a better word. Mm -hmm. You've got to kind of like create minor characters that might then have more purpose in that world. Was that a good way of kind of working your way into that narrative? In a way? Yeah, I mean, that's for me. That is far more interesting. You start with a, a totalitarian world, and you find out what sort of freakishness occurs in the margins. That's I, I could do that all day long. That's why I get worried about writing Dread because he's the he's the the barrier beyond which you do not pass. Um, but Rod. It turns out relates to dread, so <laughs> I'm essentially a fascist. <laughs> there is no helmet; it's just head. <laughs> Some comic writers, uh, one believes, uh, want to get into the industry because they have a favourite character that they absolutely want to write. And I'd like to think none of you had that motive, um, but you all have worked on licensed characters. As such, was there any excitement there, or did you just see it as a job? Um, it very much depended on what the character was. Um, when I came to write the Punisher for the first time, I, I thought, this will be fun, this will be easy. It's just one long gunfight. Instead, I found myself getting more and more bound up with the character and the stories became darker and more serious and eventually we chopped one series and began a new one, the Max book. Um, there's a little more to it than that. Uh, I was heavily influenced by what had happened on 9-11 on and I, I wanted to explore a different view of the world. Um, and instead I found myself finding Frank Castle an incredibly easy character to write. Um, not because I really share any of his values or anything, but because I can treat him as a, as a kind of force of nature. A thing that happens when pressure builds up, like a hurricane or a typhoon. Um, and to the point that I, when I write Frank now, I, I think I'll always be writing Frank, uh, that there's a kind of an ease to it, that it's, it feels like coming home almost. The rest of them, it varied. Um, I was delighted to get the chance to write John Constantine. Um, but in recent years, I, I think I've gone off that character a bit. Uh, I find something, I find there's something essentially dishonest about him. Um, in, in what way? Um, <clears throat> well, he's supposed to he, he's supposed to be this left wing figure, um, and yet when you look at his personal politics, they're they're the most monstrous, monstrously right wing imaginable. I mean, he basically uses people up. He um, 
he knows exactly what's going to happen when he when he meets someone when, when he drags them into his world I'll, I'll do you a favor if you and maybe you can do one for me Straight and he knows months. what's going to happen to them and he lets it keep happening anyway yeah. part of that is the problem with taking a character who was created as broadly speaking an essentially realistic one and keeping him going for 20 or 30 years and seeing the same thing happen over and over again I mean, it's interesting though, Garth, <coughs> when you've worked on comics for a while, it seems they either start off as serious and they turn into comedy, or they start off as comedy and turn serious. So Preach, uh, Punisher started off as a comedy and became serious. Yeah. Um, Hellblazer, you started writing seriously, and then when you came back after a break, you did like a comedy right. story. That's right, that was Carry On, <laughs> that was, um, carry on Constantine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was still quite fond of the character at that point. Um, but uh, you know, maybe that story didn't work as well, to be fair. Nice art by Higgins, though. Mm. Um, you guys have both worked on licensed characters. I mean, most recently, Cy, um, you've written a number of Henson verse, if I can call them mm. that phrase, uh, comics. Um, I mean, Power of the Dark Crystal was an adaptation <coughs> of a screenplay, while I guess with Labyrinth, you were more free to do your own thing. But you are still having to fit in with pre-existing mm -hmm. characters. Was that a challenge or enjoyable? I mean, obviously, you don't want to off publishing. Yeah, it's rubbish. I hate to do it. No, it's, it's both. It's always both with a licensed character. You, um, at the risk of sounding like a hack, you cannot take work for hire, licensed character, shared universe stuff unless you are skilled at finding a way to be interested in something. And if you're very lucky, it's a character or a world you're already interested in. Great. But you will still have to leap hurdles because there'll be somebody telling you where and what you can't do, where and what you can do. Um, when I was a kid, I loved both those movies, so it was easy to to sort of wrap my head around the idea of doing it. But you're still working on somebody else's property, and and especially with that sort of stuff. Weirdly, more so with that than with a sort of shared superhero -y thing. Mm. Um, everybody is very protective over the original IP. You can't do anything that would seem to stain the original movies. Oddly enough, so the, the Dark Crystal one was abstractly based on a screenplay, but it was a screenplay that never got made, and if I may whisper it, it probably never got made because it wasn't very good. Um, and so they gave us the kind of core of the screenplay and said, go and do whatever you want with everything else. And that's great because it's like, I don't, I don't desperately need to worry about the beats of the story, I just get to invent stuff in the margins. Um, Labyrinth, which was ostensibly make something new up. There's lots of people going, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Um, and in both cases, on those, those licenses, I ended up stepping off, sharing the project with somebody else because I had other things going on. Life was so mad, but it was hard and frustrating. And you, Rob, I mean, you've worked on all sorts of different kinds of licenses. Mm. You can see characters, whether it's Robocop, whether it's Star Wars, and now Roy the Robots. Presumably all of those different projects bring different challenges. They do, yeah. It's, um, it's that thing of trying to do something interesting with it, but an awareness you can't move the world on that much. You know, you can't... Um, especially when you've done stuff... I mean, we, we, I did Doctor Who for a couple... Well, we did Doctor Who for, we did. for a couple of years. And, um, and that was kind of like... They gave us... I think you try and find ways to make the, the stories feel like they matter. So with that, it was inventing brand new companions. <laughs> just remember, we wrote an entire arc about the Daleks without showing a single Dalek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were told there was a rights issue. That's right. Yeah, we couldn't show the Daleks and we'd already written them in. So it was a kind of... Um, but, um, but yeah, but so we, we, we gave sort of like... We invented new uh, companions. So you know nothing bad's going to happen to the Doctor, but hopefully you make people care about the companions and... The, those characters have a certain sort of amount of sort of a stakes. Yeah, stakes. Um, but it's funny actually that Doctor Who run we did. I was thinking about this the other day. I think there's some really, really good comics in there. We would we tried some challenging stuff. I'm not entirely sure why we threw so much in, yeah. it, but we kind of. Um, uh, 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 but uh, you also get a thing you're aware of. the only people who are ever going to read Doctor Who comics are Doctor Who fans you're not going to get the outside world to read those things they're people too yeah true but you can be doing some of the most challenging comics work structurally and things like that which we did um, and you know, no, no, one, no one's aware of it outside, outside of that but um, yeah quite fond of those mm. ones 
But does some of that actually come from the source material, not in terms of the story, but actually the structure? Because like Stephen Moffat at times made Doctor Who incomprehensible in a good way. But <laughs> you know, thinking, well, if the show can be that complicated, so can the comic. When you start playing around with time travel, you can really get your knickers in a twist in a, in a storytelling kind of structural kind of way. I, I pitched a, which was a good idea at the time, where time was running backwards. So page 22 of a comic was, was actually the end of the comic, but the Doctor and everyone, was, the story ran backwards, but the Doctor realises that someone's reversed time. And he starts acting against, he's the only one acting forward while the storyline is running backwards. I, I pitched that and I thought it was an interesting thing to do and then go halfway through and just when I can't do this my, <laughs> mind, my mind is dribbling out of my nose and ears while I'm writing this and I was so close to sort of telling the editor look we need to knock this on the head I mean like, there was like what's it a flux capacity no, no, what's it, then? What, there's, an, there's an armband the, yeah I know what you mean and it was a storytelling was. conceit which got me out of it and I was like oh, thank Christ for that thank you very Good much man. Oh, yeah um Obviously, you've all collaborated with a variety of different artists. Um, how much do you find yourself changing your style or even the amount of information that you're putting in the script, depending on the artist that you're working with? Not at all. Okay. Really. Um, sometimes I'll be working with someone uh, who I have plenty of experience with and they're used to me. Um, other times it'll be someone new, but until you work with someone you won't know their particular quirks so you wouldn't know how to write to them anyway mm -hmm. and I find that my scripts are so brief and contain only the amount of information necessary that there's really there's no need to adjust mm -hmm. sometimes what I, what I will do is I'll work quite closely with artists because it, perhaps, perhaps my scripts are for some people deceptively simple it's one line but everything in that line counts and there are times I've had to say to people, no, go back and look at it, uh, draw what it says there. If I've said in the foreground someone is smiling, but he can't see the guy in the background leaning on the bar grinning at him, well, both of those are equally important. You need to give me both of those. They're there for a reason. Yeah, the guy in the background cannot be a silhouette. The guy in the foreground can't be just a partial shot of an arm. So things like that, sometimes you have to drag people's attention back to, to what you've written. Um, I sometimes get the feeling that plain English is a bit deceptive for some people. Um, but for the most part, people I've worked with for a long time, you fall into a kind of an easy rhythm and they understand. Uh, so I, I've no real need to adjust. I, I, I think you're only as good as the artist you're working with. You can write the best script you've ever written and an artist can butcher it. And you can write a fairly mediocre script and an artist can make it sing and make you look better than you are. So I think when you find collaborators who you know get what you're aiming for and sell it, you cling on to them for, you know, it's a godsend. Because especially when working for, very often working sort of, um, in my experience, working for the big two, very often you, you, you're Marvel or DC, you're not um, told sometimes who's drawing your comic and the thing turns up and they just, doesn't get it you know it doesn't work and sort of you know so um which is why i think we all we, we all have favorite collaborators and we, we know that they they that they can they can get across what we're aiming for and you know it's um yeah yeah that i mean it's um when you don't know who's going to draw it my my there's that old joke about i didn't have time to write you a short note so i wrote you a long one you know, <laughs> that that's my approach when i don't know who's drawing the thing i'll just turn it into a, it's like an Alan Moore script, you know, it's like a beautiful avuncular letter to somebody you don't know, um, but not beautiful in my case. And I'm, that's quicker than your approach. I mean, I, I wish I could do that. I wish I could write a sentence to express everything that takes me half a page to write and I can't. Um, when I know who I'm working with, and especially if I like who I'm working with, then the whole thing changes. Um, and I'm able to write specifically to them. Again, it's, it's, it's a sort of communique rather than a, a set of instructions. Um, and you look for the strengths of the artist and you lean into them. Um, yeah, it's funny. Uh, R Brian K. Vaughan was over at Thought Bubble a couple of years ago and I had a drunken conversation with him. And he said, it's really simple, the key to his success find an artist who makes you feel like they're making your work better and keep working with them. 
and that's a wonderful luxury. If you can do that, then do it. Um, in practice, you end up working with all sorts of people, and mostly they're good. Yeah. You get you could it can turn you, the way you can turn you into a bad writer is when you you can write, for instance, like a sequence which is silent sequence where it's all sort of acting performances, and you think oh, this would be great. And then the if the artist can't sell that, then you've got to then go in and write horrible expositionary dialogue or something which because I am running exactly and you have to sort of the characters have to start saying because it's not clear what's going on from the pages through and then suddenly you're aware that you you are not as good a writer at, when that's going to come out because you're writing dialogue that you hate just to explain the story yeah uh, some of you are probably maybe all of you are familiar with the movie Full Metal Jacket uh, there's a scene in that where Matthew Modine is getting a bollocking because he's wearing a uh, peace button on his flag fist. Um, and the colonel delivering the bollocking says, Son, all I've ever asked of my Marines is that they obey my orders as they would the word of God. Well, the artists I work with, that's pretty much how I feel about it. Well, and it works. It works. Like I said, you've all worked on um, 2000 AD or related titles and American um, comics, which means that you've written uh, stories that are kind of eight pages of A4, you've written 22 pages of American size comic, you've written stories that are self contained, you've written stories that are serials. As such, would you recommend to anyone who's trying to break into the industry to try to handle all of those different formats so that they can either, I guess, um, be prepared for what's thrown at them, or actually just have an idea about structure in these terms. I would, I would tend towards the American format, just because that's probably where you're going to end up, unless your ambitions lie very specifically in the UK, in the with the anthology format. Um, I like the American format; it gives the story room to breathe. That said. Writing an eight or ten pager has a certain charm all its own. Um, writing the Code Prue series for Cinema Purgatorio, uh, I found myself writing in a format I hadn't in years. And um, just recently, I've written a couple of strips. Uh, Rebellion are putting out action and battle specials next year, and I've written a story for each. And getting it all into ten pages was good fun. It was. It was. Uh, I wouldn't say I'd call it an exercise. It, it certainly had its own charm. But for the most part, I think you have to think in terms of overall story, and yet you have to give the story room to breathe, and you do want those extra pages. You do want you do want to think about whether you call what you do a graphic novel or not. You are ultimately going to be doing a long story that that will be delivered in little chunks, but will live hopefully in perpetuity as a longer 150, 200 page story, um, a novel graphic or not. I think it's good discipline. One of the first things that uh, I actually listened to in all those rejection letters at 2000 AD was, here's a bit of advice, buy an American 22 page comic and try and retell that story in five pages. It's not as hard as you might think, but it's not going to be a good comic as a result. So yeah, it's good discipline to try and, to try and tell stories, I think, in that, that kind of high octave. Like Diggle was always uh, a shot of rocket fuel rather than a slow marathon, that was always his thing. Um, but yeah, it, it is clearly a lot more fun and frankly a lot more artistically rewarding working in a slightly longer form for the reasons you say. There's, you can you can be more creative with pace and rhythm in a way that you just can't in a shorter story. Well I do that, there's something to be said for the six page 2000 AD format where it's just like start, middle, end and get out cliffhanger and that teaches good practice as well but then if you can take that into the American format I think that's why a lot of sort of British writers sort of do so well with the America. They're so used to it. They, they get trained in that sort of, you yeah. know, the basics of sort of, you know, don't mess about and, you know, cliffhanger and all, all those good storytelling practices. So, um, yeah, it, it's good to try both. Well, Rob, I guess you were in the unusual position that Roy of the Rovers back in the day only ever existed as, I don't know how long, probably eight pages, you know, mm. an anthology, and now it's graphic novels. So reinventing, uh, you know, a character in a different style and a different way of storytelling. Yeah, that's interesting because they're fifty-page graphic novels, so that is kind of interesting. But it's also trying to come in it with an awareness that it's for, ostensibly for, for young adults and it's for you know for kids. So you're trying to kind of simplify your story, make your storytelling a bit more direct, which I actually think is quite healthy. I found I've quite enjoyed it. Um, 
but um, you, you can't get carried away and go through all those pretentious structural things, basically. Just, um, the, sometimes there's something to be said for like just a direct story. Basically. So no story where Roy the Rovers goes backwards through time. That's mm. happening next year. <laughs> <laughs> I, like that. I mean, Si, you've written novels as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, writing in that style and format, did that make any difference to your comic writing or did writing comics change the way that you write novels? That's a good question. I mean, the, the standard answer is that the two media are so different in approach that they might as well not be related in any way. Um, that said, I am a dreadful waffler when I come to write panel descriptions, so maybe that's because I'm used to just hitting keys and getting to the point slowly. Um, I like to think that the dialogue is the important part of the script, right? That's what the reader sees. That's the only... Um, fingerprint of the writer that is literally visible on the page when the reader reads the comic. So um, I'm less bothered about how the script reads than I am in how the dialogue reads. And as long as your dialogue is exactly what it should be, then um, prosy or condensed, however you want to approach it. In terms of long, I mean, this is why it's a good question. It takes a long time to unpack and I won't waffle I will waffle, but I'll try not to waffle. Chocolate waffles. Yeah, no, <laughs> stale, delicious waffles. Um, writing a novel is an exercise in endurance. You will complete your first draft and it'll be shit. It will be shit. Nobody has ever written the first draft of a novel that was good. So you start from a position of, I'm going to spend however many months in pain and I will get to the end of that and rather than going, hooray, I finished, you'll go, this is awful and now I need to start from the beginning again. And that simply isn't how comics work, mm. because you are collaborating from almost the get-go. There are exceptions, but that's that's the treadmill experience. So no, the two things just don't don't equate at all. Okay. How much uh, is genre of importance to you guys? Because I'm not even thinking of superheroes as a genre, but things like I mean, you obviously love war comics, Garth. Um, things like detective dramas and then whatever kind of character you're dealing with, be it a superhero or time traveling football player, um, using that kind of idea of genre as the backbone to storytelling. Mm -hmm. I've broken the Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Well, want, um, I don't believe in genre, that's why. No, I don't think I did. Good it, it doesn't particularly it's not something I, I think about a lot, really. Like you say, you just whatever you're telling, you just want to try and tell a tell a good story. Yeah, I avoid some, love others. I just think it's stupid. It's like um, horror, western, romance. You know, that's a way that you feel uh, a time and a place and a thing that happens in a story. These descriptions don't actually tell you anything about the stuff going on in the story. We've got these horrible, arbitrary, artificial things that we slot our stories into when actually we're just trying to tell a good story. Yeah, basically we just, I've got a book coming out next year called Old Haunts, and it's like, it's a bunch of gangsters in, in LA at the end of their careers, and they get haunted by their past crimes. And you could see sort of marketing going, well, do we market this as like a crime book or as a or as a horror book? And you go, well, it's both. It's just it like, it's about, like, it's about the characters, you know, it's, yeah. It's so, uh, tend not to, that's for other people to worry about, I think. I mean, even superheroes, that's not a genre. No, well, that's what I'm saying. But a, yeah, a, a superhero superior. book is a book that has people in masks and capes in it. Most of the time, they're actually crime stories. If you if you subscribe to there being such a thing as a crime story, um, or war stories, or whatever mysteries, who knows? I guess there are also kind of modes of storytelling. You know, things that are done in a more TV style, things that are done in a more cinematic style, things that are actually perhaps a more literary style. Has that ever come into your thinking when you're writing? I mean, Garth, I was just reading um, one of your latest comics, uh, A Walk Through Hell, right. and that seems to be influenced by both kind of police procedurals and horror movies. Mm. Yeah, um, I should say I, I don't really mind the notion of genre. It's a, it's a good sort of lazy shortcut for actual thinking, and I'll always, I'll always go for that. Mm. Um, as, as to the notion of... Um, well, you mentioned a walk through hell. Yes, that's a police procedural. Uh, it's influenced by the crime dramas of the past sort of 15, 20 years or so. Uh, it's also a horror story. It's also influenced by 
the current political situation on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, it's just the, the grab bag that I decided to chuck all that into, I suppose. And thinking of um, politics, I mean, obviously it's been important um, to your work, Garth, but I mean, for all three of you, I guess things kind of slip into your subconscious um, because of what's going on in the world at any time. But how often do you find that does enter your work and how often is it surprising that it's entered your work and how often is it intentional? Oof, I think you have to be so careful. I, I mean, I've messed up. I, the, I did a, a shadow mini series, and it was so on the nose about you know sort of the rise of the the right and Trumpian politics. Mm -hmm. And I stand by it. I think it's pretty decent, but that was not the place to do that story. <laughs> and um, I still get quite a lot of angry messages drifting to me through social media. Um, it's just about dealing with it responsibly. You drop it in if the context is right. I'll give you an example. The, the new Hellblazer series, for reasons I will not go into now, the whole point is that John's been away. He's been away for an indeterminate amount of time and we're dropping him back into the world. And for the first time, he's lonely. He doesn't know anybody. He hasn't got anybody to throw under the bus. <laughs> so he looks around the world and he goes, holy shit, who's in charge? What's on the news every day? This is mad. Something's gone wrong. And that's the starting point. And you can through the eyes of a character, whether or not they are some cipher for your own perspective, that's when you can um, legitimately talk about politics in a way that doesn't feel like you're just fisting your views into people's open mouths. There's an image. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the first one I did, uh, book I did was Class War, and it's called Class War for God's sake. And I was thinking back on it is, um, it feels like it's like an unsophisticated sort of punk song with three chords, but sometimes there's a lot to be said for an unsophisticated punk song with three chords, <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, Not all the time, it gets boring if you do it all the time, but every now and again. Yeah, there's, there's always that influence. I mean, uh, I wrote a walk through hell because of the current situation. I wrote Crossed about 10 years ago because of my feelings about the, the uh, second Bush administration. Um, I mentioned The Punisher when I went from the sort of madcap first series to the Max book. That was because um, when 9-11 occurred, uh, I was not in New York at the time, but I do live there now and I'd spent a great deal of time there. It's my, my favorite place in the world. And the effect that day had on the place and the people um, where there was this ghastly shock, this sense that, oh God, this is what the world is like. And I, th I saw the Punisher really as the perfect vehicle with which to explore that, not the specifics of what happened on 9-11, but that view of the world where terrible, terrible things happen that bring everything to a juddering standstill. It, it really was the perfect vehicle for it. So yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I think I'll always do that kind of material. Uh, well, we've got about 20 minutes left, so if we could raise the um, house lights a bit um, so I can actually see the audience. If anyone has any questions for anyone on the panel, please raise a hand and don't be shy. Over oh, the bar. Yeah, at the back. Um, I was wondering, uh, when it comes to research, how do you know when to stop and uh, enough's enough or if you need to do research at all for a certain piece? That's a good question. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I write a lot of military fiction and a lot of that comes from reading military history. And some of the books I read um, give me something to write about on practically every page. And there is a massive temptation to cram everything in. And you do, you do feel the need to, to step back, think about what's really important, uh, and chop the extraneous stuff. But yes, you're right, you do have to stop yourself from going too far from getting everything in. Um, another example, I wrote a Punisher story once called The Slavers about human trafficking. And um, I think doing the research for that, it was it, how it came about was, I said to my wife, I'm sort of wondering who to let Frank loose on next. She said, read this. And it was a three page article about human trafficking. And I, and I hadn't really, I knew it existed, but I didn't, I uh, haven't thought about the specifics of it. And I think after reading that article, it was the only time I really wanted there to be a punisher <laughs> in the world uh, where I thought just, just to deal with this one problem, it would be nice if there was a guy who just took them all out. 
Um, and reading the, reading the stories, the examples of things that happened to the women and kids who were trafficked, there was an enormous temptation to get every last one of them into the story. Um, there is, a, if you're familiar with it, there's a scene where Frank, um, as he goes to a social worker, <laughs> well, you know, um, because he, he wants to look at her files because she can help him. Uh, and she has just given a lecture and she explains that she had to leave a, stuff, a lot of stuff out of her lecture about human trafficking because it was too upsetting. And the example she cites are taken directly from the, the article I, I'd read. Um, that's something where, yes, I, I very much had to resist temptation. Did you see Chernobyl? They do that amazing thing where there is no way that they could have told the story with all the many, many characters who contribute to the eventual denouement. So they openly, and they say this in the credits at the end, invent a character, a female character, who is there to act as a sort of representative of all the others who, who were there on the way. I think that's a really nice example of researching so much that you know what matters and then finding a narrative solution that feels honest without necessarily hinging entirely upon the detail. Yeah, you've got to care about the characters is the bottom line, I think. And it's like, I mean, I just wrote the Destroyer short for this battle special. And it was a, you find like the actual, as, as Gar says, the, the events of the, there's something called the St. Nazaire re, uh, raid um, in World War II. And when you do some research on that, the events of it are just extraordinary. But you, at the end of the day, it's got to be an individual's journey and you actually have to tell, it, otherwise you're just filling every panel with information and that's just not good good story or good comics, yeah. you know what I mean? So you can, you can, if you're not careful, you can find yourself doing that and you become an, it becomes a little exposition machine of fascinating facts, but we want to care about a character and we want to see what that's their right. personal journey is. It's yeah, also really can, useful to have a bunch of war geeks in your friendship circle, <laughs> <that's> so <laughs> that if you've got a question, they'll just answer it for you. You can accidentally commit that cardinal sin of comics where you have a caption saying what's in the picture, which is a complete bloody waste of time. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you have a scene where a bunch of tanks lurch forward against an enemy position and the caption reads, and then the tanks move forward against them. Why did you bother? Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose the opposite is I was talking to Michael Lark yesterday, and he said when he was uh, drawing Lazarus, and, and Greg just puts in the script, you know, draw a rifle, and draw a rifle, and then get told off that it wasn't accurate enough. <laughs> so he's now got to a position, well, what kind of rifle do you want? What kind of vehicle do you want? So sometimes the artist needs to interrogate the writing more. Well, like the writer should put that on the script, I think. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, lady in the third uh, You talked about the uh, writing to the artist, and sometimes you do have to um, adapt your writing style to an artist or to get the story across. Do you find you often have to change your writing style to the uh, publisher that you're uh, uh, working for? For example, Sai, when you're writing uh, your titles for Boom, do you feel that you have to change your writing style to f work with that particular, um, the style of books that the Boom bring, bring out? And for example, Garth with yourself, when you did the books for Aftershock, because it is a new title, do you feel that you have to adapt your writing for the publisher? Not really. I mean, they they come to us because they want what we do. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no point in coming to us and saying we want you to do what you do, but but more like this, more sort of like this. There's that's pointless. Um, so no, there, there's there's no sense of really changing anything for uh, for a particular publisher. I mean, only. Only when I work for Marvel and DC, more DC than Marvel, is there a vague sense that could be a problem here if I push my luck. But then on the other hand, you know, if I've, if I've chosen to tell the story in the first place, um, there, again, everyone knows what they're getting and I know what I'm getting into. So I don't, I don't change anything so much, uh, but we're all aware of everyone's aware of who they are and what they've asked for and what they're getting into. I think I only got upgraded once and it was by Marvel and they asked me to stop writing such long panel descriptions because the translators were going mad <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of the artists will not speak English as a first language and, and that's the difference. If you know who you're working with, especially if you know that you can communicate with them in the same language, then life becomes a lot easier. 
uh, I think what Gas so ideally it's like yeah they know if they ask you to do a job they, they you know they want your take on something but problems come when they start trying to do that and it does happen it's happened to me but they're kind of like oh can it be a bit more like this and you think well it's probably why did you ask yes we're going in a bad direction here mm -hmm. it's not, not necessarily a good thing probably Too early to say whether, I mean, weirdly enough, I didn't love him to start with. I, I love the stories he's in. I think it's funny, I would describe him as a ridiculously honest character, but not in the way he treats people. He is clearly a liar and a snake and a weasel, but he knows that. He is one of the most self aware characters I can think of. He knows he's going to throw you under the bus, he knows he's going to fuck up. He also knows that having done so, he's going to spend a week feeling bad about it. And then he does it anyway. And that's fascinating because it speaks to addiction, it speaks to weakness, it speaks to um, some flaw, some mental flaw which requires him to keep doing the same dreadful things for the right reasons. And it's questionable whether they're for the right reasons. And there's just so much compelling stuff in there to unpack. He doesn't pretend to be a hero, he doesn't claim to speak for anybody, he doesn't really even believe in doing the right thing, he's just sort of trying to help wherever he comes across something that seems like it needs to be helped. What I'm enjoying, the difference I have made, is that, I said it before, he's always had a circle of people, it's almost become a joke in previous stories where, you know, he's, he's, he's been around for what, 30 years now, something like that? He's got this limitless list of friends. He must have been extremely <laughs> prolific at making yes. friends as a boy, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that at any moment he can pick up the phone and call a friend and then betray them. And I love the idea that for the first time he just knows nobody. And so the first thing he does, because it's instinctive for somebody like him, is try to collect people. And he does it in a way that is, in today's world, quite politically incorrect. <laughs> And in fact, the first in the, in the omnibus, so there's a special we're putting out this month, which is all about bridging the gap between where he's been and why he's coming back. Next month, the first issue of the new ongoing launches, and the first we see of him is standing in a pub telling a deeply offensive joke, because he thinks that's how you make friends. But the world's changed. You do that now, and you get thrown out of the pub, and that's what happens to him. So this is a, it, it's an inch. I mean, look. Let's not get into representation because you've got three straight white men on stage talking about it and we are literally the most boring representative group there is in the world. But one of the things we can do earnestly and honestly as straight white men is to tell stories about how awful other straight white men are. And that's, that's Constantine. One of the things that influenced my view of Constantine was if we say that Constantine at a certain point uh, was a a, a type known as the lovable rogue, or he had certain aspects of that type anyway. Well, I knew a couple. Uh, guys I liked very much, guys I loved hanging out with. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience with a person like that. The person who comes into the room and just lights it up, who everyone's fascinated by. And then, in a couple of instances, I met older friends of theirs people who'd known them much longer than I had, and they had a completely different take. Maybe not completely different, maybe sometimes it was, yeah, you want to watch him. <laughs> you want to watch him because let me tell you about, and then you'd hear something that, well, that, uh, I heard a couple of stories that brought me up short, and I began to think of Constantine in those terms. I thought, you know, if you did survive friendship with him, 
you'd have a very different outlook to the person who met him in a pub and was utterly charmed by him. There's a lot of Constantine and Cassidy, it, it strikes Exactly, that's where that comes from. You know, the guy who the guy who shows up and everybody loves yeah. and then it turns out, I think at one point Jesse talks to someone who knew him back in the 40s or 50s or something like that and uh, he was a nightmare and he wrecked lives. But it's, I mean, it's funny, kind of, we all hate the word problematic, but it is, we are weirdly drawn to problematic characters. I mean, you say the same about The Punisher, you say the same about Dread. These are characters that you probably wouldn't want to be in the same room as them, but we enjoy reading their stories. Because they're aspirational, even when they're arseholes. You know, they sort of, yeah. They represent something extremely strongly, whether you agree with it or not. Any other questions? Uh, when you're working on a, a new like, original, How much control do you like to have over what they look like and how much do you give over to the artist? Total. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, I'm always intrigued to see um, what an artist will come back with. This, this is when, especially if you haven't worked with someone before, um, when it's particularly intriguing. Um, I, I did a book last year called Sarah about a Russian woman sniper in World book. War II. And I worked with Steve Epting, who I'd never worked with before. I knew who he was, of course, and I'd seen his art. But that story, more than most, I recall thinking, I wonder what he'll make of this. I wonder what she'll look like. I wonder what the rest of the team, the other six women, will look like. But Sarah, in particular, because there's something quite enigmatic about her, I really was fascinated to see what Steve would come up with. And when I saw her for the first time, I thought, that's not what I was expecting. That's exactly what I was expecting. That's so utterly perfect. Here we go. And it worked out great. Yeah, it's always collaborative. But you, you, describe, you very often have something in mind. But again, if you're working with good people, they'll come up with something that you haven't seen or something, you know, and you twist and it just fits. Um, so um, you, you can never, like, it's, it's some, it is difficult, I mean, you know, the whole thing of occasionally having to go to someone and go, have another go at that, you know, but um, sometimes it's necessary. Yeah. I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Dove killed Dove characters, have you ever regretted doing it? Yes. Um, I've regretted the act while understanding how vital it was for the story. Um, I don't know if you read The Boys, but in the run-up to the ending of that, it becomes <coughs> quite murderous, and that's what it felt like. It felt like murder. Um, I hated killing off Billy Butcher, because he's my, yeah. my favourite. Yeah, but, but we have to assume, you know, um, because he's my favourite character of all time, but it had to be done. It was the right moment. There was no choice because otherwise the story wouldn't have worked the way it was supposed to. And why keep it alive in the TV show? <laughs> <laughs> I um, wrote a character, not a well known character, I wrote a character called Gerhardt, which was a SGS judge in Dread, which I kind of built up and he had a real arc over several years. And, um, and re recently sort of killed him off, but I did it in a. I wanted to do something like in The Shining when. Um, uh, I've forgotten the name of the character, the, the, the black guy, the caretaker who comes across the country and just, you think he's coming to save the day and he just turns up and gets an axe. So I, I, I had a story where Dredd was, was buried up to his, his head and, um, and was being starved for, for, you know, for several days by this, character, this bad guy character. And then it turns out when he's finally dug out, he turns around and Gerhardt's been dead behind him all the way through and he just couldn't turn his head to see him. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was a really cruel thing to do to a character that I built up over years and loved that he didn't even see how he died, he'd just been lying there dead. Um, but I thought afterwards, I, went, oh, I really like that character, you know. So sometimes you, you get excited by the, the story point and it makes total sense. But And also I like the fact that they don't always have they don't have the, you know, fully rounded arcs occasionally. Sometimes people just die, you know what I mean? I don't, I've been racking my brains. I don't think I've ever killed a character that I didn't create. And it follows that, generally speaking, if I'm killing a character I've created, I knew they were marked for death from the beginning. And so um, I don't recall ever being surprised at myself killing a character. So I, I don't 
I mean, you mourn when, when a, a character you've enjoyed writing dies. You mourn when a, f a story finishes, to a greater or lesser degree. But no, I, I, I would like to have been put in a position where I was writing some big licensed work, a superhero that everybody recognises, just to be able to fucking kill them. <laughs> <laughs> just to see how that feels. But uh, it hasn't happened yet. Conversely, you can kill a character <laughs> or be about to kill a character only to bring him back. I mean, I, uh, I created a character in um, The Punisher called Barracuda, and he was a very jolly sort of chap. And uh, <laughs> he uh, is last seen apparently drowning in shark-infested waters after Frank's blasted him with a shotgun. And the editor, Axel Alonso, begged me not to kill him, begged me to bring him. I can still remember him saying, please, man, please think about this. He's got... He's got more life in him, so to speak. And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, he really, really does. Um, and my, my personal rule writing that book was, you cannot survive two encounters with Frank Castle. Mm -hmm. You might survive the first by the skin of your teeth, but the second time, no. And so I, I brought Barracuda back and briefly gave him his own miniseries and then brought him back for the big showdown with Frank where they tore chunks out of each other and then, goodbye, that's it, you have to go. But he turned up in Fury Max and stuff. So oh, that was it. That was set. As a prequel, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Was set in Nicaragua in the eighties. That's before he's got the teeth. Now. Yeah. I'll tell you uh, again, Constantine. In order to achieve what we just talked about, in order to have him wandering around London without many friends, I had to. One of the first things I had to do was figure out why he doesn't have access to his oldest mate Chaz, um, which is quite sad because Chaz has always been a sort of feature in those stories. But it, uh, not having ever written that character myself, that didn't feel like I was kind of being cruel to a character that I had created. Nice. Uh, we're out of time, unfortunately, but I believe that all three of you are doing some more signings as the day progresses. Uh, so if you have a burning question and are prepared to queue, then. then I feel like we're supposed to, I think we're signing immediately after this. Yeah, we're like going over to the, in the, in yeah. the hall downstairs. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, if you enjoyed uh, my chat with these three white heterosexual uh, <laughs> age writers, uh, there are plenty more um, on my website, uh, panelborders.wordpress.com, and I'd very much like to thank Slice Berea, Rob Williams, and Darkness. Thank you.